Welcome to the Gottesdienst crowd, where we foster confessional integrity, liturgical preservation, and preaching that doesn't stink. We believe that the historic liturgy of the divine service is more than mere cobwebs of antiquity, but it is a true treasure of the Church to be dusted off and brought down from her attic to be enjoyed. So let's get dusting. Welcome back to the Goddess Teens Crowd. This is Jason Broughton, your host. Today we have back with us Mark Braden. He is the pastor of Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church in Detroit, Michigan. And he is a departmental editor for Goddess Teens, the Journal of Lutheran Liturgy, with his recurring column, Taking Pains. Welcome back, Mark. Uh, thank you. It's nice to be back with you. So we're Getting back finally, I think, to a program that you and I had discussed a long time ago. Um, you know, we had started to do one of these and put that out, but a kind of a historical liturgical biography, you know, going through a biography of Lutheran liturgiologists, so to speak, guys who in our communion have written extensively and contended for either liturgical re reforms or uh, going back to our inheritance uh, in terms of the Western Rite and the ceremonies that are associated with it. And so today we're getting back to that. We're going to take up Paul H.D. Lang. So what do you know about Lang? Uh, well, um, I, I never met uh, Paul H.D. Lang, uh, I have to confess, uh, although I became uh, familiar with his Alter Guild manual in the 1980s. So my guess would be 35, 36 years ago uh, when I was serving as the chairman of a mission congregation in Whitmore Lake, Michigan, uh, Cross of Glory, uh, which is no longer there. And we used the Alter Guild manual that he wrote, uh, What an Alter Guild Should Know. Uh, so that was my first exposure to him. Uh, and then uh, later, uh, when I was at Redeemer Fort Wayne, uh, uh, serving my vicarage under Father David Peterson, uh, Father Peterson introduced me to Ceremony and Celebration, which he later uh, put into reprint. So those are two of the, the titles uh, by Paul H. D. Lang. Well, since then, uh, I dug around just a little bit on a, a biography and also, CHI was very helpful, Concordia Historical Institute, uh, and they gave me some information on him so I can talk a little more about uh, Paul H.D. Lang. Uh, he's, he's one of those guys with uh, a couple of initials in the middle of his name. Uh, so we should first identify that the, that stands for Paul Henry Daniel Lang. And Paul H.D. Lang was born on May 9, 1902 in Hooper, Nebraska. He was the son of a pastor, lived in a, a parsonage, and he was one of 10 children. He graduated from St. Paul's College in Concordia, Missouri in 19, uh, uh, in Michigan, we say Missouri, uh, but I think if you're from there, uh, you say Missouri, uh, <laughs> St. Paul's College. Some of them do. <laughs> yeah. Well, my family is from East Prairie, uh, South, Southeast Missouri, and we say Missouri. Uh, so Concordia, uh, St. Paul's College, Concordia, Missouri, 1922. Uh, Concordia Seminary, St. Louis, uh, graduated in 1925. He was married uh, the same year that he graduated to Flora Julia Bade, to which he uh, dedicated the Alter Guild Manual. Uh, and then, uh, according to the records that I read from CHI, it seems that she preceded him in death, and he married again, oh, about uh, 11 or 12 years before he died. Uh, to uh, Anna Dorothea Hesselmeyer, who outlived him by 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Paul H.G. Lang served as the pastor of Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church of Palo Alto, California, uh, and he served for 40 years in that capacity. And uh, I, I was interested in the congregation because of his liturgical background and so uh, the information from the website, you'll, you'll be interested in some of the men that vicared at Palo Alto, uh, not necessarily under uh, Paul H.D. Lang. Uh, uh, Father Peter Cage, 
uh, Dr. James Busher, John Paul Soleil, who was at seminary when I was at seminary, uh, Father Daniel Grams, who serves at Ascension of Christ Beverly Hills, Father Robert Mays, uh, who serves in, uh, 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 in Nebraska, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Father Derek Roberts, Father Josh Haugen, uh, uh, John Sias, Secretary of the LCMS, uh, Father Stephen Preuss. Uh, the list of men that have served in this parish that we would be familiar with is pretty significant. I was surprised at the number of guys. Uh, so uh, the uh, 1925, uh, there was a pastor named Kurtz who did missionary work in Palo Alto and San Mateo. Um, he was holding services in a women's club. Uh, and that year, uh, uh, Paul H. D. Lang finished seminary. And he was called by uh, the Calif- uh, California Nevada, that was before Hawaii was part of it, a district of the LCMS, uh, to serve as a campus pastor at uh, Stanford University campus. He had initially been slated to do mission work in China, hmm. but there was a civil war uh, in China in 1925, who knew? And so he was reassigned and uh, became the uh, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church on December 6th, 1925, while it was still meeting at the women's clubhouse. Uh, They did build a building, and interestingly, 1928, so three years after he was called, he carved the wooden uh, panels that are behind the altar uh, for the church. So he was apparently talented in that direction. He was also a musician uh, of some note. Uh, In addition to serving as pastor of Trinity Palo Alto, he served as the student pastor at Stanford University for a number of years, seven years circuit counselor uh, in the California, Nevada, and then later Hawaii district. Uh, He retired from Trinity in 1965, so he served 40 years, and uh, he was called to our Lord's nearer presence in 1981, so 17 years after he retired. Uh, and uh, that was uh, in Palo Alto, California. So uh, remarkable uh, service uh, and very interesting life. Uh, he's, he's well published. He has a lot of titles in print. And uh, after a World Cat search and uh, some support from CHI, I have a list of many of the things that he wrote, but I don't believe it to be all of the things that he wrote. Hmm. Um, the uh, first title that most of our uh, hearers will be uh, familiar with is Ceremony and Celebration, and that is a book on uh, the Lutheran liturgy. It is a rubrical manual, but it also talks about uh, quite a bit more than just the rubrics of the divine service. He wrote a book on church ushering that was published by CPH in 1965, it's and, a small little book. It's kind of like pamphlet form. Yeah, it's 53, 53 mm-hmm. pages. Uh, and he has a couple of those, those pamphlets. Uh, he has one called The Exodus of the Practice of Private Confession from the Lutheran really? Church and Its Implications. A doctrinal, really? Yeah, a doctrinal, historical, and critical study. It looks like it was published out of the church. It's 17 pages. Uh, Also, uh, he has a devotional book published entitled The Golden Days, 1976 CPH. He has another devotional book entitled The Harvest of Faith, CPH 1979. There's a series of lectures that he gave published under the title Liturgy, Theology, and Music in the Lutheran Church. And he gave a number of these at a music seminar at Berkeley. And then uh, also another set, looks like six or seven, uh, at the uh, Lutheran World Federation Assembly in 1957 in Minneapolis. Hmm. He has a uh, 58-page booklet uh, published by CPH in 52 called The Lutheran Order of Services. He has a 39-page booklet published in 1970 by the Concordia Seminary Print Shop 
called the Service Explained for Use in Church Bulletins. And there were several printings of that. Now, to your knowledge, does CHI have all of these where we could request to get copies of them? Or do you know any of that? I mean, do you know where we can get our hands on some of these? I, I don't believe CHI retains copies of these things that are published. Um, they may they may have in the in the in the folder in the archival folders under Trinity Church rather than under Paul H D Lang. Uh, when I came to Zion in Detroit, most of our historical records were absent, and I worked with CHI to recreate a number of our historical records. They deaccessioned uh, two large archival boxes of information on Zion that they had collected going back to the 1940s. Uh, and so they, they may have some of these uh, under the uh, Trinity Lutheran Church Palo Alto. Uh, I didn't ask for them, uh, mm-hmm. but, uh, but the, other, the other place that's always good for that is uh, to go online and try to, uh, try to get them through Abe Books, which is one of the big online, uh, online used booksellers. Um, Okay, so uh, we talked about service explained for use in church bulletins, and that was, it looks like three times that was reprinted. And then uh, finally, the title, What an Altar Guild Should Know, uh, and uh, that was uh, two times published, 64 and then 68 with, with revisions by CPH. So uh, I, I was impressed at the variety of the titles uh, and at uh, the, the range uh, of uh, uh, expertise that Lang shows in his, in his published works. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I'd uh, like to do is proceed and talk about uh, the first, uh, the Alter Guild Manual. Uh, this is something that uh, many of our parishes use or have, and I had uh, four or five copies of it. Uh, that I had acquired uh, from used book sales. And uh, I had a lot of demand. A lot of people wanted copies. So I actually gave away all but one. So I'm holding the only one that I have left. Uh, And uh, it has a a bright red uh, uh, cover, and uh, it's uh, soft bound uh, with gold letters on the uh, cover. And this is the uh, 68 reprint of the 1964 original printing. Um, so uh, it is. It's dedicated in, in the inside cover to his wife, Flora Bade Lang. Um, I think there were some uh, some things that I'd like to touch on uh, right from uh, Lang's writing that I think is very telling about Lang and his role in liturgical renewal, because he is to be counted as someone who pushed for liturgical renewal in our uh, church body, in Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And uh, I, I frequently quote him in my column, Taking Pains, because his rubricale is authoritative for us, and it's very helpful. Mm-hmm. But as he, as he introduces uh, the divine service to the user of his altar guilt manual, uh, he talks about three principles— uh, the first is that the first principle of worship is that traditional forms of worship are to be retained as long as they are helpful and in harmony with the Word of God. Those forms that become corrupted or lost may be restored and purified, brought back to their originally pious purpose. So he opens with this idea of going back to a more pure form or recovering a purer form. And that really does pervade his, his work in both of the titles uh, that I'd like to discuss. That is the Altar Guild Manual and also a Ceremony and Celebration. Mm-hmm. His second principle is that everything in worship exalt God and bring his grace to man. Now, to, to us, this sounds very natural and right, what it does is it rejects an anthropocentric uh, service, mm-hmm. and it centers the service of, around God and his gifts to us. And then thirdly, since God has indeed enjoined us to gather ourselves together about the word and sacraments, but has not laid down detailed laws concerning the externals of worship, we are not legalistic about the ceremonies 
which enhance worship in our own parishes. We do not insist this or that must be done, nor what is just as wrong, this or that must not be done. As long as it is not a question of some ceremony or usage contrary to Holy Scripture, we neither criticize nor condemn. And then he goes on to talk about the differences between high church and low church, uh, Roman Catholic and Protestant, etc. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting that his first principle is that we recover the older, purer forms, but then he allows that we can't make that law. And in ceremony and celebration, he talks a lot about the idea of adiaphora and rejects that it's an indifferent uh, thing um, and uh, says that the divine liturgy can't be considered an adiaphora, uh, adiaphron in the singular. So uh, for our Goddesstein crowd, this sounds very good because it's our tagline. Right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, if, so we, uh, so we didn't make it up. <laughs> we, well, uh, I, would have to ask father Eckert. Uh, I think, uh, the, uh, uh, since, uh, Paul H. D. Lang died in 81 and father Eckert was, I, I know to be true born before 1981. Uh, he may have heard it. Uh, but, uh, we'll certainly credit father Burnell Eckert with our tagline because he's our <laughs> chief editor. <laughs> So, uh, very good. Uh, So, as he discusses uh, the beginning of the work uh, for the Altar Guild, he does it with great reverence and respect. Mm -hmm. And he first talks about God's house. And he says the church, and of course here he's referring to the building, is a symbol of God's greatness and love and grace. And therefore, the ones that serve in the Altar Guild treat the church as God's house. They keep the sacred place holy. When they go in, they walk reverently. They may genuflect to make the sign of the cross. They may kneel in prayer, adore God, thank him, and ask his blessing on their work. While they are in the church, they behave as well as if they saw God among them with their bodily eyes. They're quiet. They limit conversation to brief and softly spoken comments in reverence to God. They avoid doing any work in church that can be done in the parish house or elsewhere. Mm. So this sets a wonderful, uh, wonderful tone for the work of the altar guild. And he goes on to talk about the sacred themes. Reverence for God also includes showing deep respect for things set apart, especially for the worship of God. Uh, he uses the older name, Utsa, U-Z-Z-A-H, was struck dead because he laid his hand on the ark of God which the priests and Levites alone were allowed to touch. The altar is a symbol of the presence of God. Every time altar guild members pass it, they show reverence to God by bowing the head. Uh, And then he makes a very interesting comment. The consecrated bread and wine left over from the sacrament of the altar have participated in the sacramental presence of the holy body and precious blood of Christ, which I, is a very so, careful way. To, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so um, am I to understand that that common practice then was uh, reservation? Well, that uh, a couple times, and he'll do this also in ceremony and celebration, he talks kind of almost around reservation and Mm -hmm. talks about the elements in in case, in fact, he'll talk about the consecrated bread. So he doesn't say the body of Christ, but he'll talk about the consecrated bread at the end of the divine service being reserved in a ciborium, but he doesn't say to place that ciborium in an ombre or a tabernacle. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think he's. I think he really is uh, very careful uh, in his language uh, to encourage reverent treatment of the elements. But he he does stop short of saying that it is the body and blood of Christ uh, when the uh, reliquiae are present. Um, Do you get the sense then that he is being careful um, because? 
of the time in which he's living and does not want to bind someone's conscience on it? Or do you get the sense that he's trying to introduce thinking once again that these things are holy things and uh, he's sort of the vanguard, as it were, bringing people back to recognizing that indeed this is the body and blood of Jesus? Yeah, I, I think I think it's a little bit of both, and, and also, I mean, he's very familiar with the uh, the history of the Western Church and the practices of the Western Church. Mm-hmm. So he understands uh, reservation, uh, and he also understands how the Lutheran fathers talk about there is no sacrament apart from its intended use. And I think that he's trying to strike a middle ground in his writing. I am not uh, familiar with whether or not he reserved. One of the gentlemen that I named who vicared at Palo Alto might know that. Uh, But he certainly um, wants due reverence uh, shown to the elements after the divine service. And um, I think I I think our men uh, would be very comfortable with what he writes. Uh, His theology is very, very good. And um, even, even the, uh, the uh, ordained men among us that are a little critical of uh, our practice uh, of the reservation of the elements uh, would be comfortable with uh, the way that uh, Paul H. D. Lang describes the elements after the divine service. So I think mm-hmm. we have men that, that would believe, teach, and confess exactly what Lang writes today. Mm-hmm. Uh, very good. Now, he does, uh, in uh, the uh, uh, section on reverence and devotion for the work of those who are serving in the altar guild, he has a section on head covering. For women to wear appropriate head covering in the church is a custom of reverence according to the traditions of the church going all the way back to the apostolic days. Now, this is this is Palo Alto, California, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is this is shake and bake country, right? Uh, my my dad lived in uh, Southern California for 25 years, and I was out there a couple times a year. Uh, the, the, these these are uh, open collar polo shirt uh, shorts kind of folks, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, this idea that uh, uh, the women should cover their head—I mean, it was a different time, admittedly, 1968. But uh, California is a, a pretty rocking place in '68, and I, I think. Uh, I think that's an interesting assertion for him to make. Um, Do you know at all, was that practice followed at Palo Alto? I, uh, only because of how he's written it here, I assume that it was yes. Mm-hmm. Because he, 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 he continues uh, uh, to uh, uh, cite another rubrical manual, and a lot of times that will be peep corn in his citations. Um, it is a laudable custom based upon the scriptural injunction of 1 Corinthians 11, 3 through 15, for women to wear an appropriate head covering in the church, especially at the time of the divine service. So that, that's how he ends that section. He, uh, yeah, the, he the, the footnote indicates it's from the Lutheran liturgy. Uh, from TLL, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah he, he, I mean, he, he does frequently uh, cite uh, uh, Arthur Carl Peepcorn as well. Uh, very good. Uh, so uh, then, uh, uh, the induction of an altar guild. Now, if you are following, uh, and it sounds sounds like you have a copy. Uh, I'm on page twenty of the uh, what an altar guild shall know, and he mm-hmm. actually uh, prints here a rite for the induction of the altar guild, mm-hmm. and it's a very reverent psalm based rite uh, where the altar guild members. Uh, say that they want to be part of the altar guild. They promise to conform to the rules of the altar guild. They promise to do the work reverently. They promise to do it faithfully and regularly. And then the pastor says, I admit you into membership in the altar guild of, you know, whichever parish in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy ghost depart in peace and then there is a prayer uh, afterwards, the Kyrie, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, there's a collect uh, for them that, uh, that he has written. And then there's a dismissal. Uh, 
so uh, there, there's a, a rubric that he provides. So he, he's a rubrical guy, and uh, he provides a rubric at the end that says that uh, it should be used in the prayer offices, matins, and vespers. Uh, and when it is, it would be inserted after the canticle, so the uh, Magnificat. Uh, and uh, only that part shall be used which is spoken at the chancel rail. So you would omit the second half of the rite because you were inside of a prayer office. So uh, that's a very uh, reverent and liturgical way to approach even beginning service uh, as a member of the altar guild. It sets a wonderful tone. Um, we have uh, a section uh, beginning about page 22 uh, with simply devotions and prayers, uh, mm -hmm. the ways that the altar guild meetings can be conducted, the uh, uh, prayers, uh, colleagues, uh, attendant to those who serve. And uh, that's a wonderful section. It's uh, four or five pages. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's a lot of good resource there for pastors who are going to be holding a, uh, a meeting of their altar guild. Uh, there's uh, quite a bit there to refer to. And he has a suggestion uh, at the end of that section. It's a list of different uh, educational programs uh, for the altar guild, in, and it does include um, sewing, stitching, and uh, liturgical embroidery, which is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he uh, refers the reader to audiovisual materials uh, from CPH for those uh, titles. Uh, he goes on to talk about the prayer life, the devotional life uh, of the uh, altar guild member and the altar guild member's attendance in the divine service. And then I'd like to jump uh, to uh, the sixth chapter. So we're already six chapters into his book. And that occurs on page 33 of his title, uh, What an Altar Guild Should Know. And I'd like to just read uh, a short section that he's written about church services and rubrics. All the rites and rubrics for Lutheran church worship are given in the Lutheran service books. But since the altar guild exists for the very purpose of helping the church to observe these services more reverently, devoutly, and beautifully, through more intensive private and group study, the members of the altar guild should grow in their understanding and appreciation of them. Members should learn something about the service's history and meaning and the way they are properly and traditionally conducted. So for Lang to serve in the altar guild means that you have a heightened understanding of the divine service, which would help you understand how the things that you touch and handle are employed in, in, the, in the service of God. Uh, and that, that's a wonderful way to begin to talk about the altar guild that these are the the, uh, the these will contain or touch the holy things for the holy ones and they are treated with respect uh, but there is an understanding here that the altar guild uh, be aware of the use of the things that they're handling and touching and uh, cleaning and folding uh, in the divine service mm -hmm. um, he provides a very helpful glossary of terms for the altar guild uh, beginning on about page 38 and it's a very complete list that's very helpful and he has a lot of uh, a lot of terms in here that might be foreign to some of our men uh, he talks about the Amis of course uh, at Zion we we wear an Amis at every divine service but most of our pastors use now uh, the cassock alb style of vestment and the Amis is, isn't used in our churches anymore, for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, and uh, he explains the different parts of the uh, chancel, talks about the apse. That's the rounded section uh, uh, behind the altar or that encases the altar. Uh, and uh, that really uh, serves not only to magnify the voice, but to set the altar off as the most important thing in the church. He talks about a lot of uh, objects uh, uh, inside of the chancel, like a raridos, like riddles, like a gradine. Uh, these are 
uh, things that our pastors may be familiar with but might not know the right name for. Uh, mm-hmm. And th- this is a, a very helpful uh, guide. Uh, he distinguishes here, which is also very helpful, between the surplus and the kaha. Uh, at, at Zion, we vest our uh, acolytes uh, in our crucifer in a kaha. And uh, he, he does specify here that the celebrant, uh, and he does also in uh, ceremony celebration, that the celebrant should have a cassock on, an amus, an alb over that, uh, a cincture, and then uh, the uh, stole maniple and chasuble. Uh, do you wear a cassock underneath your alb? I do, every, every service. Do you really? I do. <laughs> <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the alb that we use here are not like the cassock alb, so they don't have a collar, and they're a very thin fabric. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we wear an amis, uh, and we uh, do wear the uh, traditional alb, and we use the very fine rope cinctures, the thin ones. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I tie my cincture in a way that creates a loop on either side of the knot in the front. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then as I cross my stole, I, I, I put that through those loops and then tighten it on the side. Yeah, I do the same, but I don't wear a cassock underneath my alb. Ah, well, uh, if you hadn't said that, no one would have ever known. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they would know. <laughs> yeah. Because I haven't fainted up for sweating. <laughs> but the other the other thing he identifies uh, in uh, in his uh, uh, list of terms here, although he doesn't do it in the altar guild manual, he does it as he describes the setting of the altar in ceremony and celebration is the ser linen, the C E R E linen, mm-hmm. which is a uh, a very fine linen that is waxed. And mm-hmm. it goes on the altar before the fair linen is placed. Uh, and uh, it, he, he omits that. Uh, he calls it here not the sere linen, but the sere cloth. Mm-hmm. And then he includes later in the, in the manual uh, an entire section on altar linens, which is very helpful uh, and, uh, and, and worth, worth a read. Did you say that it goes uh, underneath the fair linen? Yes, that's correct. Oh. Yeah, it's it's a fine linen cloth. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and then, I, I'm and familiar then, with that. I just thought it went on top of the fair linen under the corporal. Uh, nope, goes under the uh, under the. Uh, uh, so let, uh, hang on, I turn back one page. A wax treated linen cloth placed first over the mensa of the altar and under the altar altar cloths. So mm-hmm. this this the the purpose of this is to protect the altar from a spill, but at the same time to retain the elements. So if the blood of Christ is spilled, this stops it from going any further. It retains it inside the fair linen and the corporal, and Mm. it can't go through the fair linen. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, And uh, at uh, at Zion, we have a a fair linen. Now, he's he's, he's a fair cloth here. We call it fair linen. Uh, but it's actually uh, not waxed linen. It's actually a sheet of, tr- of uh, treated plastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, that goes on the altar before anything else. And then uh, I did spend some time on this in taking pains as I talked about the preparation of the altar. But the crosses that label um, the fair linen and also the cross uh, that is on the corporal are in certain places for a reason. Uh, they, they represent on the fair linen, of course, the five marks, the wounds of our Lord. But they will line up the cross in the center front of the fair linen as you unfold the corporal and you prepare the altar. The cross on the corporal will, will be placed right on top of the cross that is below it on the fair linen. Mm. And that's where the host goes for the consecration. The paten is never under the host for the consecration. And the paten is placed under the host um, before the fraction. That's the purpose of the paten. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the crosses lining up uh, also dictate where the host is placed for the consecration. But we're we're off of of, uh, Paul H.D. Lang. I apologize for that. 
No, that's all right. Good, good. Uh, so uh, then I'd like to skip forward because um, uh, just uh, in, in the view of the available time and uh, talk about the uh, chart that he provides on the anatomy of a church building and the names of the parts of the building, because this is very helpful for our people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, there you see the distinction between the sacristy or the working sacristy, uh, the ambulatory, the apse, uh, the chancel, as it is distinguished from the transept, the nave, the side aisles, the narthex. Uh, he includes a choir sacristy. Um, I haven't been in Trinity Palo Alto, but he well may have had a choir sacristy at the back uh, by the narthex. But the cruciform uh, shape of the church building is prominent in this, in this drawing, and it's very helpful. Uh, to have the proper names for those parts of the church building. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the next section that I'd like to discuss is the chapter, which comes in chapter 9, uh, and it, it has a, uh, a rendering of a very modern crucifix, which isn't particularly well done in my estimation. <laughs> Uh, but in, in chapter 9, we have about the altar and its ornaments, so the things that uh, adorn the altar. And he talks first about the position of the altar, where it stands. He gives the, the, the right terms for the foot brace and the predella, uh, predella. And then he talks about the pavement under the predella. So these are... As you work through our liturgical manuals, these are the language of our liturgical manuals. That's exactly how they identify them. The top of the altar being the mensa. Mm -hmm. uh, there is actually uh, quite a bit more to the construction of an altar that he t than he talks about here. But, of course, this is written for the altar guild. Uh, so they don't need to know the history of uh, the construction of the altar. But historically, uh, the altar was only marble or stone. And regardless of what the base was made of, there were stone columns that held the mensa, the table part of the altar. And those columns had to go directly to either stone or concrete or marble floor, and there had to be ground underneath them. Mm. So the altar was never suspended over the undercroft, for instance. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that dates to the Old Testament when the altars are made of uh, dirt and stone. Uh, he talks about the crucifix, and I think it's refreshing uh, in the 1960s to have an LCMS pastor promoting the use of the crucifix. He talks mm -hmm. about different types. Uh, he discusses the altar candles and their use. that distinguishes between the office lights and the Eucharistic lights. Uh, the missile stand. He talks about the rare dose, which is the wall behind the altar above it. Uh, the dorsal riddles, these are um, uh, fabric that would hang uh, behind the altar on either side of the crucifix in the middle. The baldachin, uh, and I've heard that pronounced baldachin, and this is the canopy that is over the top of the altar uh, that uh, uh, sets off the space above the altar. Uh, and that, that's, that's frequently uh, found in, in our liturgical churches. Uh, Redeemer Fort Wayne certainly has one. Then he provides a very helpful diagram that identifies the dorsal, the riddle posts, which, which hold up the riddles. Those are the side panels. Uh, the frontal, uh, which goes all the way to the ground on the altar. The super frontal, which is the shorter frontal. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the terminology is very helpful here, as well as his illustration. And then he steps out and talks about the chancel, the baptistry, and the sacristies. And so he identifies the chancel, uh, and he, I, he simply says, because the altar is located in the chancel, it is the most important room in the church, it is also the room of primary concern to the altar guild because the altar guild is going to be con uh, concentrating on the work uh, of, for the things that will be used in the chancel. He discusses the uh, presence of the pulpit, the lectern, the chancel rail, and he gives some illustrations of some of those. 
he talks about the sedilia, which is the plural for the the seats that the uh, clergy and servers sit in mm-hmm. in the chancel, uh, the credence table. And uh, he does talk about here individual cups, but it's kind of in a in a way that makes you believe that he really wasn't a fan of individual cups. Right. Yeah. He, you know, if they are used, then the altar guild has to care for them in, the, in such and such a way. And he says that they can only be glass or silver. If they're silver, they have to be individually cleansed like a chalice. Uh, if they're glass, they have to be obluted and then boiled for 20 minutes, individually wiped dry. And he talks about care, uh, care of the different uh, vessels. Um, he does talk about the priedu. Uh, this is the uh, uh, a kneeler with the shelf on it that we would call a prayer desk and its placement. Uh, the piscina, which is uh, comes from the word for fish. It's in, in Spanish. It means swimming pool. Uh, and this is the special sink uh, where the drain goes directly to the ground uh, for use in ablution of the vessels. Uh, he talks about the sacristies and what goes on in them. And then he moves on to an entire chapter on sacred vessels. And so he identifies the chalice, uh, the uh, cup and the four parts to it, uh, the paten, the ciborium, the pix. Uh, in Michigan, they say flagon. I say flagon. Uh, the, uh, but by the way, uh, my congregation is located in Michigan. And all of my members live in Michigan, and they cringe when I say that, but it's, it's true. Uh, this, <laughs> there is a special spoon that is used that should be on the credence that has perforations, uh, and that is in case there's any pollution of the chalice uh, during the distribution. Uh, he identifies the cruet, the lavabo bowl, which is used in the lavabo ceremony, uh, and then goes through how to prepare the altar, how to set up the altar. Now, he has the altar set up uh, very differently than I set an altar. Um, So he has the cross, uh, and then immediately in front of the cross, he has a paten. Immediately in front of the paten, he has the chalice. And immediately in front of that, he has the flogging. So um, that would be uh, the... uh, the lowest moving up in height in a line from the cross that is on the fair linen. And I, I never set an altar like that. Uh, so he's got the vessels on the altar in that, but then he talks about how to vest the chalice. And this is, this is where I learned to vest the chalice from. Uh, Mm -hmm. this is exactly the way that it is done. Uh, Although, uh, he doesn't show the scale pattern, uh, in his diagram of the scale patent is preferred. Uh, but the chalice uh, being covered with a purificator, the patent seated on top of that with the presentation host or the consecration host on the patent, the pall, a square, stiff, white uh, piece placed over the patent, and then the veil over the top. And then to the right of that, he illustrates that the burst can be placed on top of the uh the top of the veil and that's exactly how you would find the altar prepared at zion now mm-hmm. that would never actually be on the altar in that uh, shape uh at zion we begin with everything uh, on the credences and everything is processed to the altar so the altar is empty at the beginning of the mass and uh, even the missile stand is brought over uh, and then it is removed uh, uh, before we process out so the altar begins empty and, and finishes empty. So uh, take me back to what you said about the paten. Sure. Y- you said he doesn't show it used with a scale paten? No, uh, yeah. So there, there are different kinds of patents. Yeah. If, if you can imagine uh, in your mind a, an illustration or a picture of an old scale that might have been used, you know, in the medieval period where Mm -hmm. they would put a weight on one side and they would put something on the other side and try to balance it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have a well in it. No well. It's a a flattened piece of metal that's curved slightly 
but there's no bowl-shaped well in the center. And the idea is the paten for the consecration is placed under the corporal, and it sticks out just a little bit on the liturgical south or right-hand side of the corporal during the consecration. And it is only before the fraction that that paten is brought up and slid under the host. Actually, it, it, liturgically, it's immediately before the Pax Domini. So the celebrant removes the paten from under the corporal. He makes the sign of the cross on himself with the paten. He gently gives a liturgical kiss to the underside of the paten. And then he slides the paten under the celebrant's host. And that doesn't work if you use a paten that has a bowl shape in the middle of it. Oh, okay. So without using your hands, you slide it underneath the host. Uh, that's the idea. Now, uh, yeah, yeah. quite frankly, um, after the host is consecrated, the celebrant's thumb and forefinger remain pressed together for the for the entire duration right, right. of the distribution. So what I find myself doing is stabilizing the body of Christ uh, and s with my left forefinger and thumb, which are pressed together, and then sliding the paten under it, and then immediately taking the host from the paten with my right hand, and then turning with the chalice for the Pax Domini uh, to the, toward the congregation. Uh, Luther writes that that's the great absolution. It's a wonderful uh, thought that the mm -hmm. very body and blood of Christ uh, are absolving. Uh, did we satisfy the question about yeah yeah no that was great something yeah good good uh, so um, we have then uh, and let's see I may jump over just a little bit of this uh, there's a lot here as you can tell he mm -hmm. has an entire chapter dedicated to the paraments uh, and that's a, a very helpful chapter because he has the right names for all of them. And he shows uh, their use. He talks about the orphrey and the vesica, which are very helpful. The orphrey are the stripes on the uh, on the liturgical vestments and on the frontals, and the vesica is the embroidered symbol. Uh, and actually, that comes from an old Latin term, vesica piscina, which uh, comes, believe it or not, from a fish liver, uh, and it, it refers to the egg shape or the flattened oval shape that you frequently see the, uh, the embroidery on a chasuble uh, placed upon. Uh, and, and then he gives illustrations of some of the liturgical embroidery. He discusses at some length uh, the uh, care of the sacred linens, uh, the size that they are to be, um, how they are treated, uh, and how they are ironed. And then he goes into a chapter on the clerical vestments. And under the assumption, I'm sure, that the altar guild is also providing care uh, for the clerical vestments. Um, he identifies them, uh, talks about how they are uh, treated, and he even includes our old friend, the Geneva Gaul. <laughs> uh, but he uh, rightly distinguishes between uh, the, uh, the surplus and the cotta again, and then he introduces the tippet here. I'm, I'm back in the uh, uh, What an Altar Guild Should Know About page, let's see, 87. And he talks about the tippet, which is actually a preaching scarf. It's a long black scarf uh, that comes out of the uh, Anglican tradition. But many of our men uh, use a preaching scarf. Uh, and he then shows a vested uh, pastor uh, wearing an amice, a chasuble, with a maniple, that is the servant's uh, napkin over his left arm. He shows the proper attitude of the stole and the alb, although it's clear from the illustration that this pastor uh, does not have his stole crossed. The celebrant is supposed to cross his stole, and he'd be the only one wearing the chasuble. Uh, and he discusses the dalmatic worn by the deacon, uh, the tunicle worn by the subdeacon, and he even treats a little bit of the cope uh, and uh, the uh, use of a pectoral cross, very helpful. And then he dedicates an entire chapter to candles, 
what they mean, how they're used in the chancel, uh, and he gives illustrations on the presentation of candles. Moving uh, forward to liturgical colors. So he goes through the church year. He talks about the liturgical colors and their use. He provides a, a liturgical calendar uh, that uh, can, can be posted in the uh, altar guild uh, area uh, in the sacristy. Uh, goes then to a section on flowers used in the church and how they are to be uh, placed, uh, the general principles of their placement and their use. And then finally, uh, he dedicates his last chapter to the ancient Christian symbols. So he shows the different kinds of crosses in history. He identifies uh, the ichthus symbol, uh, which identifies our Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior. Mm -hmm. And then he goes through uh, historic Christian symbols to help the Alta Guild understand uh, what those symbols mean. Uh, he has the pelican uh, uh, pricking herself uh, that her young may drink her blood, uh, which we find uh, over uh, at Zion in our chancel as well. Uh, and uh, m many of the Trinitarian symbols he includes and explains. And then he has the symbols for all of the apostles and the proper dates for the observation of their feasts. He finishes with a section on Luther's coat of arms. Uh, so uh, that's a, a brief summary of the uh, what an altar guild should know. Paul H.D. Lang, first printing 1964, uh, then reprinted 1968 Concordia Publishing House. And uh, that uh, brings us to the uh, close of that volume. I'd also like to discuss uh, the volume Ceremony and Celebration which is a uh, liturgical manual that is uh, uh, extremely useful for our pastors and very well written, very well structured. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps we could do that in a second installment of this discussion. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's uh, do a part two to this and um, we'll pick up with that next time. That's wonderful. I look forward to it very much. Thank you very much, Mark. You're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you.